Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered for September 26, 2018, attorneys for the family of Botham Jean plan to sue the city of Dallas for the killing of Jean by cop Amber or former cop Amber Geiger. Of course, at the time she was wearing her uniform badge and used her service revolver when she shot and killed Jean in his own apartment. We'll talk with attorney Lee Merritt as well as the mother of Botham Jean, Allison Jean, from St. Lucia. Bill Cosby is in prison tonight, just the beginning of his three to 10 year sentence for drugging and assaulting Andrea Constant in 2004. This morning on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, I talked to his PR team and they shared the details about his final moment before he was led away to prison. You will hear that interview. Also, the murder trial of the Chicago cop who killed uh, Laquan McDonald. The defense introduced a 3D reconstruction of the shooting the officer's point of view. They still got to deal with why 16 shots were fired into Laquan McDonald. You'll see for yourself uh, that reconstruction. Also, we have a live report from a reporter from Chicago. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio and I talk about how to fix education for all children, and he talks about ending segregated schools in New York. Well, of course, where they were actually weeding folks out, we'll explain to you that a new system that will be in place in the city. Also, counterterrorism expert Malcolm Nance is here to talk about his new book, The Plot to Destroy America. Now, remember, his previous book pretty much was dead on with what Putin did to our election. He'll explain to you what they have planned for the midterms as well as 2020. And Will Smith turned 50 yesterday, and he bungee jumped out of a helicopter. Folks, when you see this video, uh, Will, I'm turning 40 in November. That's 50 November. Ain't no way in the hell I'm jumping out of a helicopter. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. All right, folks, for the past hour, Donald Trump has been rambling at a news conference uh, called at the White House. Of course, he is trying to lead the fight to keep uh, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, uh, of course, uh, uh, on, on the right track when it comes to his Supreme Court nomination. He's going to, of course, testify tomorrow, as well as we'll hear from one of the women who is accusing him of uh, sexual assault. Now, of course, in this news conference, Trump was five minutes in before he started lying. He's lied about U.S. Steel building eight plants. It's a lie. He's lied about, he actually said 52% of women voted for him. No, that's white women, Donald Trump. 41% of women uh, voted for you. Trust me, black women were smart not to do so. Uh, and so there were so many other lies we couldn't even keep up. Uh, so uh, if he's still rambling, let's just go to the news conference just, just to see what the hell he's talking about right now. They were talking about him on the Supreme Court 10 years ago. With all of that, I want to hear what she has to say. But you said that okay? you don't feel, but you said that you feel like there have been numerous false allegations against you. And that because oh, I've had that, many you, false. You understand what he I've had many through. false statements against me. And if the press would have reported, I would have been very happy. I think John Roberts would tell you and that you covered the story where the women were paid to say bad things about me. Uh, Sean Hannity covered it. I will tell you, when I saw that on Sean Hannity, I actually called him. Believe it or not, I don't speak to him very much, but I respect him. I called him. I said, this is the biggest story. This is a big, big story. He agreed with me. The next day, I picked up the papers. There wasn't one word about it. The next day, I watched ABC News, John. I watched NBC. I watched CBS. I didn't watch CNN, but next time, I'm going to. And are you OK with I watched story? everything. There wasn't one story other than Fox. And it's a big story. It's a shame. Okay, enough. Thank okay you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay if I give it to the New York Times, Mr. President? Go ahead. President? That's enough, please. Okay. Good job. Good job. Mr. President, could, could I ask a question since I am from the New uh, York Mr. Times? Mr. President, 
before this gentleman? Because you did, did you wear? Since you I, wear? I'm actually from the New York Times. Uh, Yamich is my former colleague, and we miss her. Uh, I but I was hoping I, I, don't, I could I don't ask blame a question. You, but I'll let you do it after he does. Okay. Is that okay? That's I will perfectly do that. well. In honor of a paper I once loved. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, my name is Edward Zal with True News. Uh, today you met with uh, Bibi Netanyahu from Israel, and uh, you brought up actually that you support yeah. a two state solution. Uh, for now, of course, the exchange you just saw there was with Yamish El Sindor, a former New York Times uh, reporter who's now uh, working for PBS. Uh, and so uh, she, and I, she may have been the only African American who's asked the question. Uh, I was listening to it earlier, was not being able to watch it, so I wasn't sure who else was asking questions. And so uh, they've, they've asked him about any number of things. Of course, it was largely about Brett Kavanaugh, but he's talked about the economy, he's talked about trade, he's talked about, of course, meetings in the United Nations, uh, also talked about Iran, the Kurds. Uh, as well as uh, North Korea, South Korea, a, n a number of issues. Um, uh, I don't think anything black has come up, uh, which is no shock uh, at one of these news conferences because you got a few black people who are in the room asking questions. Uh, and so uh, we'll, uh, so he's, I think the question now he's uh, dealing with, uh, it was right, right before we went. He's also talked about, of course, NAFTA, Canada, Mexico, trade deals as well, has complained about uh, the Federal Reserve increasing uh, interest rates. Uh, also, one exchange that was absolutely just a joke, y'all gonna love this one. So Trump touted how, oh my goodness, I'm going to be able to appoint 145 federal judges. And then he says, Obama, he wasn't, he wasn't big on appointing federal judges. Um, actually, he was. But when you had Mitch McConnell, who was blocking and obstructing those judges, when you had Republicans who would not give him the hearings for those judges, that's one of the reasons why there were so many vacancies Donald Trump uh, when you became president, because your party refused uh, to have confirmation hearings for the various judges that President Barack Obama actually tried to appoint. Uh, and so it's not like all of a sudden he walks to the White House and goes, hey, there's 100 vacancies. Yeah, because it was created based upon obstruction. And I guess we should also remind him that Merrick Garland was appointed by President Barack Obama to the Supreme Court, but Republicans said we're not going to have any hearings whatsoever or even meet with him as a result. Uh, and so, again, uh, numerous lies in this news conference, one of the reasons why we use the hashtag Trump Lies Matter. So let's go back to see what uh, any more lies, uh, and I'll take this for a few minutes before we go uh, with the next interview. So involved. He loves Israel. He loves Israel. But he's also going to be very fair with the Palestinians. He understands it takes... Two people to be happy, two groups of people to be happy. Everybody's got to be happy. And that's why it's so tough, because there's been so much hatred and anger for so many years. That's what probably the number one ingredient of toughness is. But they asked me, I said, I think it's going to be a two-state. Uh, and Mr. you know what I did today? By saying that, I put it out there. And if you ask most of the people in Israel, they agree with that. But nobody wanted to say it. It's a big thing to put it out. It's a very big thing to put it out. Now, the bottom line, if the Israelis and the Palestinians want one state, that's okay with me. If they want two states, that's okay with me. I'm happy if they're happy. I'm a facilitator. I want to see if I can get a deal done so that people don't get killed anymore. When we had, in Saudi Arabia, we had one of the great conferences in history. Mm -hmm. Many of you were there, probably all of you were there. It was one of the most beautiful, Two days, that and China. Okay, I'm bored. All right, let's go on with the rest of the show, folks. The family of both of Jean plans to sue the city of Dallas, as well as the former Dallas cop, Amber Geiger, who fatally shot uh, him in his apartment earlier this month. Now, Lee Merritt, uh, who is the attor uh, family's attorney, uh, they have made it clear that they are suing both of them because they say in this federal lawsuit, Geiger was still operating as a Dallas police officer because she was wearing her uniform and used her revolver as well. Now, the lawsuit has not been filed as of yet, but they certainly plan to do so. Uh, and I want to go to Lee Merritt right now, uh, who is the attorney for the Botham Jean family. In just a moment, I'm going to also talk to Botham Jean's mother, Allison Jean, as well. Let me go to Lee first. So, Lee, uh, with this particular lawsuit that you plan to file on behalf of the family, uh, again, explain why you're filing against Geiger personally as well as the city of Dallas. Well, the truth is when Geiger entered Botham's apartment, she was ap operating under the color of state authority. Uh, it doesn't matter when she clocked in or when she clocked out. What it all comes down to is whether or not a reasonable person would have perceived her as operating as a police officer. 
And uh, part of our theory is that she likely gained entry into Mr. Botham's apartment because she was donned in a police uniform. She, she was wearing a badge and she was uh, carrying a service weapon. And also, after the shooting uh, took place, she was still being treated as if uh, she uh, was uh, uh, in the line of duty, correct? That, that's exactly right. So she's gotten all the benefits of a police officer involved shooting, um, all of the, the time to reflect before she was interrogated and arrested. Uh, she's benefited tremendously from her position as a police officer. Well, the city should also be held accountable for its role in retaining that officer in poorly training that officer, uh, and in, a, in its role in facilitating the culture, quite frankly, with the terms of their policies and procedures, where it's all right to, uh, to shoot an unarmed black man. And we know that that's happened in the city of Dallas repeatedly, uh, and that there's been no significant policy changes in order to prevent that. And so the city is going to have to be held accountable as well. Uh, and uh, when do you plan to file this lawsuit? The truth is we'll, we will likely wait until the grand jury has returned an indictment for murder um, or an indictment period. Uh, we, we're putting first things first. So as we run our concurrent, concurrent uh, investigation, we're turning over information to the district attorney's office so they, they can present a full case before the grand jury. But once that process is complete, we will likely move forward with our lawsuit. Okay, Lee Merritt, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, folks, joining us right now is Allison Jean. She is the mother of Botham Jean. She joins us uh, from St. Lucia, where he is from. And, of course, uh, his funeral, uh, he was uh, actually buried there as well. First and foremost, uh, Ms. Jean, uh, our uh, prayers and condolences to you and your family for the loss of uh, your son. Uh, by all accounts, he was certainly a tremendous individual, and it is sad uh, that at 26 you had to bury your son. Yes, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, um, how did you, um, who reached out to you to let you know what happened to your son? Uh, and just describe for us um, uh, what uh, took place and, and how you discovered uh, what Amber Geiger had uh, done to your, uh, to your son. Yeah, well, I was in New York City with my daughter. Um, she lives in Brooklyn. And just about 1240, she received 12.40 a.m., she received a telephone call from someone who said that they were a social worker at the Baylor Medical Center, and they indicated that my son was shot and killed. At the time, um, we didn't know exactly where he was shot, so all sorts of things kept, came through my mind, wondering whether it was a burglar whether it, whether he was robbed or whether he was hit by a street bullet or whether he was in bad company because I knew he was never in bad company, but all sorts of things flashed my mind. So um, that is the point. That is when I got to know. But it was soon after um, someone from the police department telephoned my daughter again and said that, said the same thing, that he was shot and he, he didn't make it. Um, and just a few, maybe about half an hour later, I got a, a message on Facebook Messenger from somebody else. And so I got three confirmations. And that is at the third point, the third um, message that I, I understood that he was shot right in his apartment. Uh, were you, uh, now we've seen photo, a photo that was taken of your son as well as Amber Geiger. Uh, to your knowledge, did they know each other? Um, did, did, did they talk? Uh, did they see one another? Just, did, did you have any information or any knowledge that Amber Geiger knew your son? My son was very open with me. And if he was seeing someone, he would tell me. And he never, ever spoke to me about this Amber Geiger. So from my recollection, from my knowledge, he did not know her. Um, your son um, worked uh, in the city. He led worship at his church. Um, for folks who don't know uh, more about him, um, what was he like? And when did he come to the United States? And so uh, when did he leave St. Lucia uh, to come to the United States? Yeah, my son left St. Lucia in 2011 to go to the Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas. 
he spent four years um, at Harding before he gained an internship at PwC in Dallas, Texas. So he moved, he, he spent, it was initially a six week internship program, but they invited him to remain for six months. So he spent um, that amount of time in Dallas, moved back to Arkansas to complete his degree in accounting and information systems. And then he was immediately offered a position by PwC. So in June of 2016, I believe, he moved back to Dallas and worked with PwC until his death. What, t what kind of child was he uh, growing up? Well, like all of the children, he was very active. He was a very active boy, but very determined. Um, I never had to nudge him to study for exams or anything like that. He always had a plan all laid out. Um, in St. Lucia, we have a an examination after elementary school that allows you to gain a place at a high school. And out of five over 5,000 students, he was 20, 30. So um, he went into what we know as the top high school on the island, and he spent five years there before moving on to a, a sixth and seventh, or what we call, I think, 12th or 13th grade. And after that, he worked for two years before going to university. He was always very, he, 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 was plan, he was a planner. He always spoke about um, failing to plan, is planning to fail. Um, he was very active in his church, in the church in St. Lucia where we attended. He, he also brought, when he went to Harding University, he brought students on several consecutive years while at Harding to do charity work on our island. So he visited the a center for delinquent boys. He also visited the orphanage. He helped in the community. He he loved singing, so he would just go to people's homes, people who he felt needed comfort in. He would go with a group and sing with them. So he we we had I had no difficulty with him. He was very warm. He loved everyone. He was very affable. He was what you would call the life of the party. As soon as he entered a room, everybody was lit up. He was always very joyful. So his his loss is, is, is tremendous for me. I just keep reflecting on the fact that I will never hear, get a telephone call from him again. And the last question, uh, his birthday is on Saturday and there's a rally planned uh, in the city of Dallas, downtown Dallas. Uh, to uh, remember him and to celebrate his birthday, uh, that certainly has to be tough uh, because uh, any parent, uh, especially a mom who birthed a child, uh, they, uh, they, they, birthdays are special not only for the child but also for the mother as well. Yeah, well, both my, my daughter and myself were already discussing the gifts that we would have sent to him um, for his birthday. So... And I'm, I keep getting email notification that his birthday is coming up. So Saturday, I know, is going to be very tough for me. Um, and, you know, just the fact that I know that they're having all of these rallies and, and vigils and so on. But for me, I don't know what I'm going to do on Saturday. I, I really wish I could just run and hide and never ever have to see that particular day because it's going to be very very difficult for me to face that day well so john we certainly appreciate you joining us uh right here on roland martin on a filter to tell us more about uh, your son to share his story and certainly our prayers will be with you uh, and your family uh not just on saturday but also as you have to continue going through this uh, because uh, this is certainly will be a long process uh, as uh, they go through a grand jury, go through a trial, uh, and then uh, hopefully uh, a jury will do right and sentence, uh, uh, actually convict Amber Geiger uh, for the shooting death of your son. Yeah, thank you.
We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, folks, uh, Bill Cosby yesterday, of course, was sentenced to three to 10 years in prison. Last night, spent the night in a state prison. He, right as we speak, he's at the Phoenix State Prison, about 30 miles outside of Philadelphia. Now, of course, the 81-year-old Cosby uh, was transferred from the Montgomery County Jail to that particular prison uh, because the Montgomery County Jail was unable to uh, care for him and handle him because of he, uh, he is blind. Of course, he was uh, sent to prison uh, after being convicted for drugging and uh, sexually assaulting uh, Temple University uh, basketball coach Andrea Constant at his home outside of Philadelphia in 2004. Uh, and as we said, he uh, has been moved to that particular facility. Uh, it's not been decided if that's where he will remain. He may be moved to another prison, but he is at this particular facility now uh, where they have uh, a prison hospital to keep here for him. Now this morning on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, I talked to his two publicists, uh, of course, Andre Wyatt and Ebony Benson. They strongly defended him and also shared with us exactly uh, what happened uh, leading up to Cosby going to court as well as uh, what took place in, place in the aftermath of him being sentenced to prison. Here's that conversation. Was Bill Cosby, when he left home, uh, did he did he believe that uh, he would be uh, headed to prison? Was he prepared for that? Good morning, Roland. And first, thanks for having uh, us on your show. Uh, yes, Mr. Cosby was prepared. Uh, he's been prepared now for 34 months because uh, he shouldn't have never been there. Uh, this was a miscarriage of justice. So he had prepared himself. He didn't feel that he was going to get any special treatment. Uh, because of how this judge has acted towards him and his district attorney. So he was prepared. Uh, Ebony, um, that particular moment when uh, the judge said it is time for uh, justice to be served, and then uh, he said three years in the course of the 10 years, which means that he will have to serve at least three years before eligible for parole. The New York Post is reporting that, uh, that uh, Bill Cosby was uh, laughing with, with the two of you as well as other folks in the courtroom. Was that the actual case? Yes, sir, it was. Again, he has been prepared for this since this began. He's known what he's been facing with the injustices in Montgomery County, and we knew that it could go one of two ways. Either they were going to allow him to stay out while, um, while he appealed, or they were going to set the sentence in a time frame that he would not be able to stay out during his appeal. So again, he he's held his his head high the entire time, and he's strong. His spirits are very strong. Many people have said that he obviously yesterday that after but before the sentencing, Bill Cosby could have had something to say to the court. Uh, some say that uh, that's when you express remorse or you at least uh, apologize. Uh, did he give any consideration to doing that before the judgment was rendered? His decision has always been to not say anything. Uh, they was going to misquote him and misconstrue his words no matter what he said. It wasn't going to make a difference if he said something. The judge's mind was already made up. Their mind was made up three and a half years ago that they were going to throw the book at this man with no evidence, uh, no proof, allegations that surfaced uh, from other distractors. And they used those to bring him in along with a campaign ad that the district attorney ran, a Willie Horton style ad, said, if you elect me, I'll bring Bill Cosby to justice. When he settled out for $3.8 million and they told him charges would never be uh, brought against him. So, uh, Mr. Cosby, we, we knew how they were playing. Uh, this was one of the most racist and sexist trials that we've ever seen in the, in the history of the United States. Ebony also, when, Mr. Cosby, would, I'm sorry, I was just go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Me. No, go um, ahead. Just speaking of speaking of that word remorse, you don't show remorse when you maintain your innocence, and Mr. Cosby has maintained that. Uh, both, uh, there's been a very, very uh, aggressive defense of Bill Cosby. Uh, even after the mistrial, uh, Andrew, when the statement was read by Camille Cosby, uh, highly critical of uh, this judge as well, legal observers uh, said uh, that was a bad idea because this judge was always going to be, ser be over the second mistrial, and even missing. Uh, the hiring of a former prosecutor to inve investigate. Um, it, it, it explain why uh, the Cosby's were so aggressive in going after the judge, knowing full well uh, he was going to be the one who was going to uh, uh, determine this sentence. 
Well, because this judge and this DA were swayed by public opinion. And uh, they knew that they were going with what uh, these distractors wanted. They were going with what Gloria Allred wanted. Uh, this had nothing to do with justice. And I think as a person who has been around for 50-plus years, like the Cosby's, they've seen it all. Mr. Cosby said uh, something really significant and profound to me. He said, I sat with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. I sat with Malcolm X. I sat with Nelson Mandela. Uh, he said, I, I met people who were dogs in the 60s, bit off their prostate. He said, what do I have to be afraid of? They're going to do whatever they want to do to me, no matter what. This is one, one of the greatest civil rights icons for 50 plus years. And they did not like the fact that Mr. Cosby was using his celebrity, his his human being to humanize, humanize all races, all genders, all religions. And that's what they did not, did not like. So this was more personal, and this was uh, a vendetta against him because of the platform that he stood on, the revolutions in the home. Well, I, I, was, I wasn't comparing him to Jesus. I, I was exactly. just saying how he has been how he has been crucified, you know, in the media and public opinion. And I, I specifically said at the end uh, of my statement, I said I'm not comparing him to Jesus. What I am saying is that they they crucify black men across this country. Look how young black boys are being killed every day. Look how uh, they're using this judicial system to go after uh, black men like Mr. Cosby. This is bigger than Mr. Cosby. Uh, this is about every black and brown man in, in America. You look at this guy, Kavanaugh, and how he's been protected, and you have people saying that, hey, there's no evidence for 30, 20 years ago. The due process it, it, and, and and the president of the United States is protecting him, and it's okay. And they're saying the FBI should not come in and investigate because there's no evidence. Well, what about Bill Cosby? It, it shows us that the judicial system is truly black and white. Speaking of that, uh, obviously this case was specific to Andrea Constat. They allowed others to also uh, testify in the second trial. Uh, but folks are also saying, look, that you've had allegations that have been made against Bill Cosby, not one, not two, not three, uh, more than 60, and a third of them have been black women. And so, Ebony, I'll ask you first, uh, m making reference to Emmett Till or others, uh, folks are saying, wait a minute, this wasn't a case of just uh, white women accusing Bill Cosby. Th these are also black women who also accused Bill Cosby. Your response? Um, I will start with it was majority of white women that accused Bill Cosby. There were a few black women that came out, but these are also accusations. These are all, as you said, this is because I said it, it has to be true. Um, when you compare it to Emmett Till, we're not talking about the number of women. We're talking about the principle, the principle that someone can say it happened and then you are now destroyed because of it physically for Emmett Till publicly and in the media for Mr. Cosby. How is Miss Cosby doing? Yeah. Oh, Mrs. Cosby is, uh, as Mr. Cosby says, when Mrs. Cosby is, is at the helm, we all have great posture. Uh, <laughs> she's strong. She's fighting. And we're uh, working on appeals now to get him out of this. And we filed motions. And uh, we will be visiting him this morning. And real quick, do you know if he's in general population or is, in, is, he, is he in isolation? We have no clue. Uh, we will find out when we visit him this morning uh, how they're uh, where they're holding him. All right, folks. Also, I was just uh, texting with Andrew Wyatt. For, so a couple of things. Radar Online reported uh, that when Bill Cosby got uh, to the prison, a hot dog was sort of thrown at him and he was complaining about the food. And they also reported uh, that uh, he was on this conference call uh, talking with his wife saying, hey, pull the checkbook out and get me out of here as fast as you can. Uh, Wyatt said that's actually a lie. They, they, he said they actually talked this morning, not last night. Uh, and that he said this morning around 9.30. Uh, and Andrew Wyatt said that uh, uh, he told uh, Mrs. Cosby that he's been treated very nicely. People were shocked to see him, but proud to get a chance to meet him. Uh, and he also said that the two of them will be speaking again uh, in about 30 minutes as well. And so, uh, and relayed that Camille Cosby uh, told him that uh, from that interview that, uh, that she said, quote, you know, she told him that, quote, you did a great job focusing on facts. And he said, thank you. And all he expects is the truth to be 
told. And so um, that's, uh, of course, uh, Andrew Wyatt uh, talking about uh, his client, Bill Cosby, of course, who is in a Pennsylvania uh, state prison uh, as we speak as a result of uh, going to, uh, after going straight there, uh, he wanted to be able, of course, uh, to be put on allowed to be out on the bail pending appeal, but the judge declined that. I want to go to our panel right now. Joining me right now is Pastor Shannon Wright, third vice chair of the Maryland, Maryland Republican Party. Also Derek McCoy, executive vice president of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. Uh, and it was very interesting. I was, I was going back and forth with this lawyer on Twitter and who felt that she said, well, you know, why are you defending uh, Bill Cosby's legacy? I would say, well, first of all, I'm not defending his legacy. I said, we know how to have multiple conversations at one time. Absolutely. I said, you can't just, she said, well, you know, if you can't focus on the victims, victims don't say anything at all. I said, well, well, you, you, you're not doing what I do. I said, the reality is, uh, when it comes to this case, there are multifaceted pieces here. And that is obviously uh, the conviction, the sentencing, how he's doing, what the appeal is going to be. Uh, also, Camille Cosby, of course, her being aggressive, going after uh, the judge. And also, how folks view his legacy. All of those things are worthy of, of black folks talking about. And also, folks who say uh, that, look at the sentence that he got, but then you can show various white folks who've committed sexual assault who got probation. All of those things can be talked about at the same time. They should be. <laughs> We're not a, a one issue at a time kind of society. When you, <laughs> when you become grown folk, you're expected to multitask. So when you look at the victim, you look at the perpetrator, you look at their family, you look at the involved families, because regardless to how things happen, everybody has reasons, issues, feelings, and emotions, and I don't think any of them should be overlooked. Okay, Bill Cosby did some things that he shouldn't have done. Granted, nobody's arguing that, but he did a lot of good, too. Over the years, he did a lot of good, and I don't think that we should forget that. The, the, the Bible says, hate the sin, love the sinner. So we don't throw him out with the bathwater. You still take care of the victims. You still make sure his wife is okay. But all involved are still human. I agree, too. I mean, I think um, you definitely have to be able to talk about multiple issues at one time. We're not monolithic as, as a society. And I think uh, there's no question Bill Cosby was an icon in our, you know, in our time frame. I mean, you know, you grow up looking, looking at him, listening to him, and everything else he's done. Uh, his wrongs, whether they're right, wrong, and I know they were defending him vehemently, but, you know, we, we should be looking at a total issues and, and several different issues at one time. Uh, and I think that, look, I mean, what, what you have here is you have 60-plus women who made uh, allegations against Donald Trump. Right. Excuse me, against, well, first of all, about 22 who made against allegations <laughs> against Donald Trump, 60-plus who made allegations against, uh, against Bill Cosby, uh, but he was convicted of the Andrea Constant case, right. uh, and that was the only one that has actually gone to trial. Right. Uh, some of those allegations go back as far as 50-plus years. Some of them are a lot more recent. Uh, and what and what you have here is what you have, and I do believe that as a result of this case, as a result of other cases, that you are seeing women uh, who are choosing not to wait 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, to actually share these details. We see with Harvey Weinstein, uh, folks who actually reported uh, that, 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 that he raped them uh, as a recent as two, three, four years ago, and that's one of the reasons why he was arrested and charged and is facing an indictment. Mm -hmm. You know, there are different stories and different doctors and folks that have been coming out of the woodwork saying, well, sometimes you, you wait a long time because it's traumatic. Sometimes you wait a long time because you actually forget and block out certain things. If <laughs> issues of sexual abuse are not easy issues, they're, they're not easy for folks to talk about and explain. They're not easy for the victims. They're not easy for anybody. So if something happens, I think that you kind of owe it to the one behind you or next to you to say something when it happens so that you can stop it from happening to somebody else. Or so you, if it does happen to somebody else, you can be a role model or example for them of how to get through it. But if you keep it in the closet, it, it just festers. It just and, and, was it, and it also was interesting, you know, folks are saying, for people are looking at um, people of color, African Americans in particular, saying, mm -hmm. well, why are you having this conversation? We can talk about the Catholic Church. And how you have this ambivalence uh, to deal with this. We just saw in Pennsylvania yeah. where they came forward and showed decades of massive cover-up 
in churches where bishops move folks and they cover these things up, cover the crimes up. And you had one particular church uh, where one priest, uh, multiple cases where they said he sexually assaulted someone, where you still have people who say, no, no, he was a great priest. Uh, and I just simply can't believe those things. And so uh, it is human nature <laughs> to uh, uh, believe somebody who they might respect, they might uh, revere, and we have to understand that that's also part of the difficulty with people making making uh, the complaint because they're saying, wait a minute, they're going to believe the, 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 the bigger person, the known person, than just little old me. Well, absolutely true. At the same time, Roland, what you're finding, too, in today's society is if one person says it, well, we question it. Two people say it. Well, I think that's a solidified a accusation. Three people, we automatically say, well, they absolutely did it. And so it, we begin to dismiss it and begin to believe the people who are actually accusing the person. Except so, if it's Brett Kavanaugh. That's not always the case. Go ahead, final there. comment before I go to the next story. So, you know, there have been a lot of cases that have been talking about the, the comparison between uh, Bill Cosby and Brett Kavanaugh. They're, they're very different circumstances. Listen, if somebody did it, then they need to pay for it. They need to be accountable for it. But I'd like you to find me a room of six people on Capitol Hill that can say they are without sin to cast that stone. That's part of the problem. He's not, whether he did it or not, he's not the only one. There's a whole long list. How much taxpayers' money has been going to keep it all quiet? Right. Find me six that can't say they be, they've been accused, that, that aren't guilty of it, and then let's talk about that. All right, let's talk about Chicago, where mm. Jason Van Dyke is on trial <laughs> for murder for killing Laquan McDonald. Now, yesterday, the defense showed the jury a 3D reconstruction of the shooting from the officer's point of view. Now, take a look. Now, if you see this, this is their reconstruction uh, of this. Now, he, here's the issue. We, had, we actually have a video. <laughs> That actually shows what took place. Uh, and if they're trying to also show that McDonald uh, was a threat to the officer, uh, you don't see that in the video. You don't see it because it's not like he was charging towards him. Remember, Van Dyke lied, initially saying Laquan McDonald was charging towards him with a knife. Yet when the dash cam video came out, it showed that Laquan McDonald was actually moving away from uh, the officer. And... We also know that Chicago police officers went to the nearby Burger King where they had surveillance cameras there and erased the video. That's called a cover-up. Joining us right now to tell us what uh, took place in the courtroom today, we have WGN Radio, Do uh, Mate Pongo. Uh, Do Mate, and so this reconstruction... Uh, Do Mate. Uh, Do Mate, I'm sorry. This reconstruction, I, I'm just trying to understand what... Wh there's an actual videotape of Laquan McDonald being shot. Right, right. The defense was trying hard to make the case that what we saw in the video from Van Dyke's perspective was a bit different from what you'd see from the dash cam video. They're saying that he closed in on Officer Van Dyke. And if you see that numbered meter at the top of the video you just showed there, it shows the amount of feet that Laquan McDonald is away from Van Dyke. Well, he closes in, according to this video, at about 16 feet. Now, right there, you see at about 16 feet, they say he clo closing in, he began walking at 30 feet, now he's at 16 feet, 13 feet, uh, when those shots were fired. That's the case that the defense wants to make. On cross-examination, prosecutors began to say, well, if this video is so accurate, why then don't we see the uh, bulletproof vest that the officer is wearing? Also, looks like in the video, the Laquan McDonald is wearing all black. Uh, what is... In, in, in actuality, he was wearing blue jeans. They start to point out these really minute details to try to just cast doubt on the validity of the video, aside from a lot of the other uh, discrepancies that you mentioned, Roland. Uh, and obviously, they want to uh, create reasonable doubt. They're trying to actually uh, plant that in the minds uh, of the jury. I'm just not buying that it's working. Yeah, it, you know, they, they fought quite the uphill battle. Today, uh, what happened in court was, was another uphill battle. The guy who actually made the phone call uh, to police officers, Rudy Barrios, he's a truck driver. He was one of seven witnesses called by the defense today. And uh, before court started, Judge Vincent Gahn said, if he's not in this courtroom today, I'm going to strike that video that we just saw from... Uh, from from the evidence that's prevented and, uh, presented to the jury. And he hasn't, prior to today, showed up to any of the court appearances. And because, likely because, 
He didn't want to be a part of this high profile case, but he did show up in the courtroom today. And in his testimony today, he said that Laquan McDonald lunged at him with the knife and that he threw a cell phone at him and threw some rocks and some gravel at him. And that's when uh, Laquan McDonald ran away. And he called police officers and said that there's a teen who seems to be breaking into cars. He thinks he's stealing car radios. And that's when the police arrived at the scene. Prosecutors in cross-examination said, well, you were able to fend him off with your cell phone and a handful of gravel, correct? And he said, correct. And, you know, I'll let you, uh, let you see what the takeaway might be from that. Uh, bottom line is, uh, J.C. Van Dyke's defense team, uh, they have an uphill battle again when you actually have a videotape, a dash cam videotape showing what took place. It's a little hard to reconstruct the lie. They did lie that night by actually putting one thing in the police report, and they, the city, tried everything they could not to release that a dash cam videotape, and now we know why. There are definitely some other falsehoods that the prosecutor wanted to point out. So also called today by the defense was Leticia Velez, a police officer who was there at the scene the night that Kwame Donald was shot. In her testimony, she told the jury that that her partner immediately went and frisked Kwame McDonald once he was shot, and that's when the knife was recovered. In the dash cam video, the moments immediately after he was shot, you don't see him pick up the knife. You don't see him officers attend to him. You don't see them search or frisk him. And the prosecution said, I mean, this seems to be inconsistent with what we see in the video. She doubled down and said, if that's what I said, that's what happened. So you have a few inconsistencies. A lot of what was said in the police report doesn't seem to square away with what we see in the video. That is part of a different case that will be forthcoming uh, involving the other police officers who were there the night that Laquan McDonald was shot. And in days prior, uh, last week, some of the officers that were called to the stand were given immunity uh, in order to testify because, you know, they could be uh, they, they could receive some disciplinary action because of the inconsistencies with their reports. Shocking. Chicago police officers lying on the stand. Don Matia, we really appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Roman. All right, folks. Uh, earlier in the news conference today, uh, Agent Orange was talking about a number of different issues. Yes, I did call him that. Uh, it's, I'm sorry. Uh, this is very simple. I have respect for the office of the President of the United States, but I really need the person who's in it to actually respect it first before you actually can get that kind of respect. And so, as a part of the news conference, he talked about Russia. He's like, no collusion, no collusion, no collusion. And he also said that uh, he's probably going to delay his meeting tomorrow with Rod Rosenstein, Deputy Attorney General, uh, So, which means that he'll wait 24 hours to fire him uh, because he's desperately trying to stop the Robert Mueller investigation. My next guest actually called all of these things, talked about what Putin and Russia was trying to do. Uh, he is Malcolm Nance. He has a new book out. It is called The Plot to Destroy Democracy. How Putin and his spies are undermining America and dismantling the West. Uh, and he joins us right now. Malcolm, how you doing? Hey, how are you, Roland? Uh, and so, uh, as we watch this unfold, now we have now we have Donald Trump who's saying no collusion, no collusion, no collusion, no collusion. And now he wants to call Rod Rosenstein in, of course, who is over uh, Robert Mueller because you have Jeff Sessions who uh, recused himself. And now we are hearing that Trump is going to fire Rosenstein. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and so for a guy who keeps saying no collusion, he's doing a damn good job of obstruction of justice. <laughs> he's doing an excellent job. And you notice that he's focusing on the word collusion. And he's doing that, and he's been doing that for well over a year principally because there is no crime called collusion. And he is saying that as part of, you know, it was Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist, who said, when you're going to tell a lie, tell a big lie, and repeat it over and over again until it becomes the truth. Donald Trump is playing that game. The crime here, and the one which people have been charged with, is conspiracy against the United States. That is the one thing that he is terrified of, and what he wants to do by constantly harping on collusion is to play to his base so that they and Republican congressmen will be believed whatever it is that he says. And then when real crimes are introduced, like conspiracy, he will have one third of this country not believing it. Uh, and, of course, uh, he has been going after Robert Mueller, and then he keeps saying, oh, they found nothing. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's a hell of a lot of guilty pleas to say nothing has happened. Yeah, well, you know, he has a very interesting definition of, of nothing. And that's principally because, as we saw in today's press conference, Donald Trump lives in an alternate reality, and that's just an objective observation. He does not believe the things that he sees. He wants us to believe 
the things that we see are not true. Therefore, he, when he crafts that meta narrative that that there is no evidence whatsoever in this, he believes it. He incorporates that. He you know puts that in in his own uh, bubble of reality. He projects that reality out to his followers, and they come to believe it. And no matter what you can say, do, and show, they will not believe the reality that they see. Now, the reason I'm having this discussion about meta narratives and reality is because this actually is a technique that the Russians had devised over decades to craft a reality around someone whom you want to lead around by the nose ring. They call it. Uh, originally, it was called uh, perception management. The Russians have a technical name for it, but it's part of their information warfare strategy to characterize and and to essentially craft Donald Trump's um, worldview and decision making algorithm so that whatever he does, it benefits Russia. And if you see how he spoke today about Vladimir Putin, it's been pretty successful. Well, and again, I mean, he praises, he praises Putin. He praises his great friend in North Korea. Then, of course, he talks about his great friendship uh, with uh, the Chinese leader. Uh, these are all dictators. Well, you know, he has an affinity for dictators. If you look at his United Nations speech yesterday, he praised dictators. He attacked our allies, our traditional allies. And as I wrote in Plot to Destroy Democracy, the strategy that both Donald Trump, autocrats, and dictators like Vladimir Putin want, is they understand that democracy, the guardrails of American constitutional republicanism, are the one thing that stops them from being dictators. So Donald Trump at the United Nations dismissed and actually insulted uh, everything that has occurred in the United States history since World War II. He said himself, he does not believe in globalism. He believes in what he called the doctrine of patriotism, which, by the way, doesn't exist. But that's his worldview. He is wholly ignorant. He doesn't understand history. And he is affecting a strategy that was developed by Moscow. And he is a wholehearted believer in that dictatorship and autocracy is a better form of government than American democracy. All right, and last question. We have a midterm election coming up in 40 days. Uh, and, of course, uh, Congress in this White House has done nothing uh, when it comes to uh, safeguarding our elections. Uh, as an intelligence expert, uh, what do you expect uh, Putin and his cyber uh, bullies to be doing when it comes to the midterm election? I don't think that we're going to have the level of intensity that you saw in 2016 in the 2018 elections in terms of putting out bots and trying to influence people. I think the real danger comes after the results come in. And I say that because let's say, let's assume that polls hold true and that it's a blue wave election. If the way that Russia can best assist Donald Trump, the Republican Party, is to perform mischief in the favor of the Democrats during or after the election in order for the Republicans to start calling for the nullification of the result. That's where real mischief can come in. All right, Malcolm Next, folks. His book by Malcolm Nance is called The Plot to Destroy America. How Putin and his spies are undermining uh, the plot to destroy. No, actually, I, I, it should be called a plot to destroy America, but it's called a plot to destroy democracy. <laughs> how Putin and his spies are undermining America and dismantling the mess, uh, dis 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 dismantling the West. And of course, his previous book was the plot to hack America. Again, if you read, saw that book, he called it before it actually happened. And so, Malcolm Nance on point, man, I appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. My pleasure. All right, folks, going to go to a break right now. We come back. We'll chat with New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio about education in New York and segregated classrooms. This is Roland Martin, Unfiltered. We start with gifts. Merit comes from what we make of them. Novelist Jean Toomer.
All right, folks, our uh, HBCU Giving Day School today is University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Their website is www.uapb.edu. So we certainly want you to support uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff. We must, of course, uh, uh, fund our own freedom and save our HBCUs. Uh, now let's talk about education in New York, where Mayor Bill de Blasio is praising a plan uh, to confront segregated schools where students are screened uh, when it comes to the classrooms. That's a huge problem, uh, and uh, because for many black folks and Latinos, they're being frozen out of some of the city's most elite schools. Here's my conversation with Mayor Bill de Blasio. Mayor de Blasio, glad to have you here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, first off, um, this, this whole issue of um, integrating the schools in New York, for a lot of people, of course, they think that New York City extremely liberal and progressive, but when you look at education, for years, it has been a segregated school, what, separated by the haves and the have-nots, in many cases based upon race. Roland, look, um, we've got hundreds of years of American history that are playing out in this city and cities all over the country. There's no question about it. Uh, it's first and foremost about race and economics and uh, the kinds of jobs people had, the kind of incomes they had, the kind of housing they had, where they were allowed to live and where they weren't allowed to live. And uh, it's left us with a city uh, where, yeah, our schools, uh, you know, end up reflecting that. And we've got a lot of work to do to address it. Now, I, I've said from the beginning, we can't address all those realities through the schools alone. And I think that's a really important point of honesty that we can do a certain amount through our schools to create more diverse uh, classrooms. A lot of what we have to do beyond that is about raising wages, raising benefits, creating a lot more equality in our society across the board. But what we are doing here, and I'm really proud of what the parents of this city are increasingly doing, is they're stepping forward with real specific ideas about how to diversify district by district. We've got 32 school districts in New York City, 1.1 million kids in our public schools. And now we've had three of our school districts come forward and create their own grassroots plans with the help of our Department of Education that are going to create a real step forward for diversification and now are becoming a model that we can take citywide. Uh, and, Mayor, it's interesting because I'm looking at a New York Times story uh, on September 20th where uh, the headline was de Blasio acts on school integration but others lead charge. And it says the plan was created not by City Hall or even the Department of Education, but by parents in District 15, which includes the Brooklyn neighborhoods of Park Slope, Sunset Park, and Red Hook. And so in many ways, again, for me as a supporter of school choice or parental choice, whatever you want to call it, I mean, these are parents who are saying we want to be active in the education of our children. And so I get their point, but I don't have a problem having parents telling City Hall and telling the Department of Education we want changes to how, how our kids are being educated. Well, Roland, I think uh, the reality here is we are looking for change that will last, that will be deep-seated, uh, that will um, succeed on an ongoing basis. And I think in this instance, you, you know the history of efforts at desegregation around the country when it comes to education. It's a, it's a checkered history, to say the least. And uh, often has left out the question of the quality of the schools for kids of all backgrounds. We believe we have a, a broad mandate to fix our schools, to make schools high quality across all neighborhoods, all zip codes. But meanwhile, I think there's a really a positive way to diversify our classrooms, but it has to be with parental buy-in and a real grassroots involvement to avoid the pitfalls and the conflicts of the past. And that's what we're seeing here. So in this case, look, the Department of Education is a part of the process every step of the way, or it wouldn't ultimately work. I mean, we're playing a very active role, but it is true that we're welcoming grassroots leadership and we're welcoming tough community conversations for people to recognize how important the change is. And yeah, it will come with uh, changes that will affect their, their lives, their families in some ways that some parents may be hesitant about. But it's going to get us to a, a greater goal of more diverse schools, more diversified schools that are better for everyone. And what we've found is if you give parents that seat at the table, they're really buying into it and they're helping to lead the charge. That's the difference from the top-down attempts at desegregation that often failed because they ran into a lot of community opposition and didn't address 
the core question of making sure all schools improve simultaneously. And what jumps out at me, so, so exactly, so for folks who don't know about New York City, uh, what is the current uh, process? I mean, how does it work? Uh, are, every, are all schools screening? Uh, and does this apply to just so-called specialty schools, magnet programs? Uh, so explain it for the folks who are unfamiliar with how New York City operates. Okay, so this latest uh, step forward is District 15, and I'll explain to answer your question in the process. This is the part of Brooklyn you refer to, often called Brownstone, Brooklyn. It's the area of Brooklyn that I come from and my kids went to public school in. It also includes some neighborhoods, including Sunset Park and Red Hook, that have been historically disadvantaged. So it's an interesting mix of different types of neighborhoods. This is about uh, moving away from screening uh, for our middle schools. So whereas, for example, elementary schools generally are done, you know, the selection process, the, the application process is around geography and a zone you live in. Uh, and even that has been something we're trying to address uh, and diversify by changing some of the zone borders in some parts of the city. But historically, um, elementary school is about where you live and what school zone you're in. But choice starts to be applied at middle school and then, of course, high school. So the choice programs include a lot of schools that were called, quote, unquote, screen schools. And those were schools that were often considered to have higher standards and uh, be very appealing uh, for parents to get their kids into. So, so, the, so the problem, I, I got to ask you, those, go screen, those screen schools. So, again, I, I went to a magnet school in Houston. Uh, and so I, had, so I had to apply to get into the magnet school although another part of the school, Jack Cates High School, students who were zoned there went there. So for these, these schools here, now granted, that was a magnet program. So we talk about these screen schools, are these specialized schools or are they just traditional public schools, but because of their, the rigor or because of, uh, of you know, how other students have turned out, that you have to uh, essentially uh, be screened to get in? So just a, a great question. I'd say, you know, these are not uh, the kinds of middle schools and high schools that we still have plenty of that are based on a geographical area. They are uh, schools that kids apply to from a wider geography that have a specialty typically, uh, that have certain standards that historically they've held in terms of, you know, whether it's grade point average or having a portfolio of work that you've done or, or other standards that defined how kids got in versus, for example, uh, a school that is something you're geographically zoned for where all kids got in equally. So what's happened here in this district in Brooklyn is that the parents said, we want to actually get rid of those screens. We want to get rid of those filters and just say, kids are welcome at any of the schools in our district, any middle school. And then we're going to ensure fairness by having a system of ensuring that each school basically reflects the demography of the district. So, for example, if uh, lower income kids make up about half of uh, the student population of our elementary schools in that district, then each middle school should reflect that pretty much. And that's going to be a factor in how we create balance and get representation from all types of neighborhoods. And kids would be welcomed in regardless of their academic achievement levels. And it would put the responsibility on the school community, starting with the principal and the teachers, to help kids of all backgrounds, you know, all working together in the same school, lift all boats. That's the underlying idea, that the screening, although I think the screening was uh, done in many cases with no ignoble intent, uh, what happened over mm -hmm. time was it did create that kind of skew. And it did create a situation where a lot of classrooms were not diverse enough. And what the parents are saying, and, and Roland, a lot of educators are coming forward saying they believe in this, even if it might mean honestly more work for them, is mm -hmm. they want a more diverse student body. They're ready to take on the challenges of some young people who haven't had as much uh, educational opportunity, and they believe they can help all kids simultaneously. Just a couple more questions here. And first of all, according to this New York Times story, this is going to impact 11 of the city's roughly 600 middle schools. Is that correct, or is it going to be more, more schools impacted? Well, for it's this district is the one, and I, I don't know if 11 is the exact number, but it is one of our 32 districts and just the middle schools. But what really matters here, as I mentioned, two other districts have done uh, a variation on this approach with their elementary schools. So we now have uh, three districts that have either elementary school or middle school or both where they're creating diversification efforts with a lot of parent buy-in and that have real grassroots support. 
So this is now a model that we'd like to see go farther. We're providing grant money, as is the state of New York. We've got 10 districts now uh, that are ready to act on creating their own plan, uh, again, starting with grassroots involvement. And uh, we think this is just going to keep spreading, and we're going to encourage it. I'm going to help it every step along the way that I can as mayor. But but what I think is so powerful here is this is a honest grassroots momentum fueling this, where more and more parents are saying, you know, this is just the right thing to do. And and every time they see another district do it effectively and without a lot of rancor. I mean, there's always going to be some angst, and there's always going to be parents worried that in some way it might affect their kid uh, that they don't want to see. But mainly what we've heard is voices saying we can do better. And let's find a way to do this together. Um, just, uh, so you, of course, have been trying to take over the schools uh, and, and wanting to be more involved in education. Uh, and also... Well, we have mayor I'm just to interrupt. We have mayoral control gotcha. of education here. It has to be renewed in our state gotcha. legislature, but that is the reality right now. Uh, and one of the things that... And so the legislature has not renewed that, correct? They have to next year, so Got we it. have it. Then there has we have to go through the process again. So one of the things that, that jumps out at me, again, is that, and, and I've been following this, of course, uh, because, like I said earlier, uh, I certainly uh, support uh, school choice. There's no form of school I don't support as long as it works. So for me, that's traditional public, charter, magnet, homeschool, online school, technical school. I don't care. Uh, and so there's been this constant back and forth in, in New York uh, with charter schools and, and whatnot. Uh, do you believe that charters can play a role if, and again, my, from my position, they must be successful? Just like I believe traditional schools must be successful. Why do we have to have the either or? Why can't we operate, operate with and? Well, Roland, I agree with the concept that um, there's room at the table for all schools that work. I think what's happened here is that the debate got skewed, and I really feel like this was true before I came into office, that there was a bias in our Department of Education in favor of charter schools that in some ways was not about the quality, but was a philosophical favoring of uh, charter schools over traditional public schools, and I think that was a mistake. Um, the fact is that the charter school community is very diverse. There are some schools that are absolutely outstanding. There are some schools that are extraordinary at teaching kids in a, in a very modern, progressive way, critical decision-making and critical thinking and problem-solving and the things that really typify what we need in education today. And bluntly, there's some other schools in the charter world that are incessant test prep factories and that earn their reputation with great test scores but taught kids exactly the way that's been rejected by most educators. So there's a lot of range there. I want to see the schools that are doing things the right way and succeeding uh, get our support. And we, by the way, I, my number one signature initiative in general was pre-K for all. We did that with charter schools. They were welcome to the table. Religious schools were welcome to the table, community organizations. That's part of why it worked. So, no, I, I think we can break down that kind of artificial debate, artificial barrier uh, that used to exist, but with a clear philosophical and quality uh, consideration that it's not all charters are good or all charters are bad, but with charters, we need to see them take all kids like our traditional public schools do, including special ed kids, English language learners, kids who don't test as well, treat them with equal respect, equal support, and not make the curriculum all about test prep. All right, folks, uh, back with our panel here, Pastor Shannon Wright, of course, third vice chair uh, of the Maryland Republican Party, and also Derek McCoy, executive vice president of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. Here you have this city, as I asked him, I said to him, this progressive city. Mm -hmm. And again, what you have in these so-called progressive cities mm -hmm. are white parents who want their kids going to the elite schools. You can sit here and talk about who's progressive and who's conservative and who's liberal at the end of the day. When you talk about the inequities in this country, mm -hmm. it is still right there in our face in education. So my, my, my question would be to you, how unfiltered are you? Because that was a whole bunch of words that didn't say nothing. We've been dealing with segregation in schools for how many de de generations and decades? It, oh, it didn't ever? take grants and plans and programs to get there, but it's going to take grants and plans and programs to turn it around because there might have been a bias in the system before he came. And we want buy-in from the parents. See, when you say you want buy-in from the parents, it's because the first pushback came from the school administration itself because they didn't want that. They wanted to make sure that certain kids that they d deemed 
<laughs> worthy, we're going to get the proper education that they could, where the resources would be diverted to mm -hmm. those schools. So when you say that we want the parent buy-in, that's no, that just means that now some parents are awake enough to see what you're doing. Right, because in this particular district you're talking about, mm -hmm. parents, they are the ones who for, are forcing this because their deal is, wait a minute, our kids are the ones who are getting screwed because you have a screening process, as opposed to, wait a minute, uh, you know, again, you can sit here and go to school. You you want to be able to go to uh, to study there. That's the again. These are all the little cute little things that have been put in place that deny us opportunities, uh, and and you're still seeing that right now. Whether it is elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and New York City of all places, it's worse than a lot of other places in terms of how they still have the the schools that are going for the elite students who are largely white. Absolutely. They, they've been doing this for quite some time now, but I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of almost in the same frame of mind that I applaud parents being involved in any kind of educational opportunities because that's what really helps kids propel to success. At the same time, looking at this, when you begin to segregate kids and, and put barriers and blockades up that, that kind of ostracize the ones who really need education, I think that's a terrible thing to do. I think, you, you know, uh, the mayor has a lot of work to do in this regards, and I think the city should not be, almost like Pastor Shannon Wright said, you know, in one of those things where even if you had a predisposition or predisposed aspect before you came into office, you know, I think it's a both-and issue. You no, know, actually, what I want to see is I want to see more parents, uh, fract frankly, railing against these school districts yeah. uh, and, and, and trying to tear them down because, it. again, they, if you're a parent, you are not waiting for a superintendent's five and ten year plan. Your deal is you my kid has finite years That's right. and I can't wait for y'all's plan to somehow kick into high gear. Absolutely. True. You know, it, I'd like to see there be less need for parents to go and tell them how to do their job. Because <laughs> their job is to educate our children. Well, my but here's job the deal. But, but look, is to pay the taxes yeah, to make Frederick, sure you have the resources yeah, but, to do okay, it. Okay, that, that's great. But Frederick Douglass said uh, power concedes nothing without a demand. Oh, no, no. I'm not saying so, for them I mean, not I mean, to. I mean, I would love for... I would love for parents not to have to do it, but the reality is uh, if school systems have not been doing their job, parents need to do it. need folks to Absolutely. put a level of pressure That's right. and then make it as uncomfortable as yep. possible yep. Uh, for school boards, yep. for superintendents, Absolutely. for mayors who control schools. When I say uncomfortable, wherever they show up, you have you folks with bullhorns showing up Absolutely. as well saying, are you going to educate my kid like your kid getting educated? That's right. I totally agree with that. You get you. They have to do that. They got to bombard the gates at, right. at every single level. I would even encourage people: look, uh, run for office, run for the school board, try and get involved. Oh, do whatever absolutely. you can do I'm with to that. have your voice in there because you only have so many years. I was in the same situation with my own kids a long time ago, but uh, you know, looking at it, I said, well, I can either wait till this school district, which I'm supposed to be in a decent one with my house, uh, gets it together, right. Or put them in a private school. Man, I had to put them in a private school. Or else I'm looking at a black young man that's not going to be making it. Well, I'll tell you right now, my, my parents didn't have private school money. And everybody knew uh, the names of Reginald and Imelda Martin. There you go. All schools and principals and folks at the district. Uh, and so, and, 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 so and, 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 I, and I guarantee you that somebody who's sitting here watching who's saying, uh, yeah, but you probably came. No, I ain't uh -uh. come from one of those backgrounds. Mom and daddy never went to college. Uh, went, look, I could stand on my porch and see the DEA and the FBI take down a crack house, literally <laughs> three houses down. Uh, and so mom and daddy never made more than $50,000 combined ever in their life. Uh, but they gave a damn about their five kids, and they made sure to put that pressure where it needed to be put when it came when it came to education. And so we certainly want to see more of that. All right, folks. Uh, yesterday, Will Smith turned 50 years old, and uh, in July, Will Smith uh, announced that he was going to bungee jump out of a helicopter over the Grand Canyon. I sent Will a text saying, "You done lost your damn mind." <laughs> I said, Will, I turned 50 in November, but I'm telling you right now, ain't no way in hell I'm jumping my black ass out of a helicopter, bungee jumping. I don't care how many safeguards are there. And so uh, they actually live streamed this on YouTube uh, on yesterday. Uh, it's about an 8 to 10 minute video, but we're gonna, we, we edited it down. Y'all, check out Crazy Will Smith. If you're scared, you're not going to take the chances that you need to take to, to realize your dreams. And that was the thing for me. I don't mind being scared, but I'm still going to do it.
This is gorgeous. This is gorgeous. Yo. This is some of the most beautiful stuff I've ever seen in my life. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, folks, if you go to youtube.com forward slash Will Smith, you can actually see the entire video. Uh, his whole family was there. Uh, and you know, and actually he put on Instagram, he said, you know it got to be major. He said, when the ex-wife and the wife are both there to watch, uh, you do something that crazy. Uh, and so uh, Will Smith certainly had a great time uh, bungee jumping out of a helicopter. Will Smith, certainly happy birthday uh, on your 50th. Uh, and I'm letting y'all know right now, November 14th, when I turn 50, ain't happening. Where am I going to be? My black ass probably be playing golf. But I ain't jumping out no damn helicopter. <laughs> Just letting y'all know. It's all good. All right, folks, don't forget, uh, we want you to support Roland Martin Unfiltered doc, uh, by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com uh, to join our Bring the Funk fan club. We will be restreaming this show at uh, 10 p.m. Uh, at uh, 2 a.m., 6 a.m., and 10 a.m. as well. Uh, we thank all of you uh, for your support, for supporting the show. Uh, we appreciate all of you for watching as well. Don't forget to share this video uh, on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope as well. Tell your friends. And be sure to like the Facebook page and set a uh, like uh, course. Follow us on Periscope and uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. We're trying to hit 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. And be sure to set your live notifications on Facebook, Periscope, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. So when we go live, it automatically pops up on your phone. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be hearing from Will Packer and Malcolm Lee about their new movie, Night School, starring Tiffany Haddish and Kevin Hart. Look forward to that. And of course, we'll have the bre breakdown of the testimony in the Supreme Court nomination of Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, thank you so very much, folks. And also, don't forget to download our audio and video podcast from Google Play and iTunes as well. Uh, to our panel, thank you so very much for joining us. And, folks, we'll see you later. Have a great night. Holla!